I'm Mark Golub, and in the news, APAC and its annual National Policy Conference that recently concluded in Washington, D.C. A galaxy of Jewish leaders and thinkers were featured throughout the three-day conference, along with a galaxy of leaders of American government. Now, I'm sure most of you understand what APAC is. APAC, the America Israel Public Affairs Committee, is the formal lobbying organization of American Jewry, with the job of influencing members of Congress, and to some extent the American administration, to support policies advantageous to the State of Israel. APAC is nonpartisan, though it's seen by many, especially those on the far left, to be a right-leaning, if not right-wing, Jewish organization. And members of the left argue APAC does not represent the sentiments and policy positions of the entire American Jewish community. But the reality is APAC has always promoted bipartisan support for the State of Israel, both Republican and Democrat. Many of the leaders of APAC are staunch Democrats, some very close personal friends of former President Obama, while there are also many Republicans associated with APAC leadership. It also is a simple reality that of late, there seems to be an erosion of support for the State of Israel among members of the Democrat Party, exacerbated in part by a Republican invitation to Prime Minister Netanyahu to address a joint session of Congress in opposition to the President's Iran nuclear deal. And while many in the Jewish community viscerally hate Donald Trump, can give him no credit for anything positive which he may do, there also seems to be among many Democrats and those on the left a visceral dislike, if not disdain, for Prime Minister Netanyahu, also made all the worse by the support the Prime Minister has expressed for Donald Trump. This was the backdrop of this year's APAC National Policy Conference, where many of the 18,000 attendees well remember the moment candidate Donald Trump brought a majority of APAC attendees at the Verizon Center to their feet, including Democrats, when Mr. Trump alluded to President Obama's time in the Oval Office coming to an end, a display of partisan support against the Democrat president, which embarrassed APAC and prompted an APAC apology and a rebuke of those who had stood and cheered from the APAC stage the next morning. So, how did APAC go this year? Were there any similar moments of controversy? How was Vice President Mike Pence received? What about UN Ambassador Nikki Haley, who's become the darling of pro-Israel American Jews? And how were members of the Democrat Party received? Chuck Schumer, Nancy Pelosi, Robert Menendez. Well, once again, we turn to one of the leading journalists on the world Jewish scene. He's the longtime Washington Bureau Chief of the JTA, the Jewish Telegraphic Agency, who always has perceptive things to say about events of national Jewish importance, Ron Campius. Ron, thanks so much for joining us again. Thank you. Thanks for having me. First of all, Ron, you were there. How would you rate this year's National APAC Conference in terms of interesting speakers and panels and overall enthusiasm generated among those in attendance? I think the enthusiasm was high. It's always high. I mean, you had record numbers, 18,000 people. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, you know, and the, the, the problem with APAC for journalists is that so much of it is closed to press. Uh, so you, we can only judge, I could only judge based on the main stage and maybe a few breakout panels, but certainly they were of like the usual high quality, very interesting exchanges with politicians. And I spoke to people who went to the uh, breakout panels and they were very... They're very, very interesting. A lot of them um, uh, having to do with, like you were talking about, att attracting uh, progressives to the pro-Israel 
cause, getting into the nitty-gritty. And in the past, when APAC has left those panels, open those panels to the press, they've really been high quality uh, in terms of uh, the level of discourse on a, on any given topic, whether it's a scene in the Middle East today or politics in America. So, you know, and you, you just got that sense talking to people coming out of the uh, panels, just uh, witnessing the hustle and bustle that this was another successful APAC conference. Yes. By the way, spend one moment on the aside you made. There have been some pieces written this year by the media, Jewish press, that has complained about Apex restricting so many sessions, breakout sessions, to the press. What's yeah. your own understanding of what's behind that, and how do you personally feel about it? Well, it's frustrating. They want coverage of the conference in depth, and they and it's, they make it difficult to actually cover the conference. In the past, there was a uh, a, a rationale. I mean, it changes from period to period, but for a number of years, a, a whole bunch of breakout sessions were open to the press, and some of them were closed uh, for one of two reasons. One is that uh, they were uh, they were open to people who paid some more than the basic fee to get into the yes. conference, which this year was five hundred ninety nine dollars. Yes, I can understand that. You know, yeah. you're paying for a uh, an inside look at whatever, and uh, how how much more prestigious is it if if the press is there, then everybody gets to hear it. Uh, and then the other one was uh, training for lobbying. They didn't want the press to be in. Well, but otherwise, they let every, every it, people in for everything. It just becomes frustrating. We can't uh, cover. We can't uh, convey the breadth of uh, the things that APAC uh, conference goers. Uh, get and it's you know it's a, it's a it's a very high quality conference and so i i think it's a shame uh from their perspective and it's just frustrating from my perspective okay i again i think you say it perfectly i would just add i've experienced this i was there for many years and each year we were restricted more and more and more right. and my own sense is you know if at the conference itself a session is open only to those who have given a certain amount of money. I understand that piece of it. But if the press can be there, or if JBS can be there to tape it and then show a session a week later, two weeks later, mm -hmm. uh -huh. it's not, it, it doesn't hurt those who at the time are the only ones allowed in. And I think the only thing that happens is APAC doesn't get the chance to get the message. Its message is very powerful. Some of the mm -hmm, speakers yeah. are brilliant. And it's losing the opportunity to reach a wider audience of Jews and non-Jews. I think it's counterproductive. All right, in terms yeah. of plenaries then, and the few breakouts you were able to go to, but how about the plenaries? What did you consider to be the high points of the plenary sessions? In terms of enthusiasm, I think it's like you said, Nikki Ailey got a rock star reception. Yes. Twelve standing ovations. They <laughs> they love her and she's she's just this very natural, easy speaker. You know, she she's got some rehearsed talking points, but that you're listening to her, they don't come across as rehearsed talking points. It's like you're chatting with your, your best friend over coffee, except you've got eighteen thousand other people at the room. She's yes. just really uh, you know, and you know, she's she's just been a very pronounced pro Israel presence in the United Nations. She's made defending Israel her preeminent issue in the United Nations. Yes. So she's, a, she's a rock star. For and sure. by the way, just spend one more moment on Nikki. Did she say anything that was new? Anything that you as a journalist heard and said, oh, you know, I want to make sure I, I get that out. Was there anything new or was it simply, it's nice to have Nikki Haley present? It was mostly nice to have Nikki Haley present. The one wrinkle that was new that was interesting was, if you'll remember, during the General Assembly vote condemning the, uh, President Trump for recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's capital, she said, we're going to take names, and then, then Trump said, we're not going to give money to these countries that, um, uh, that vote against the U.S. Uh, on Israel issues, on other issues, but on Israel issues particularly. Uh, and then immediately, people pointed out, well, that would mean cutting assistance to a lot of countries that the United States considers critical, like Egypt and Jordan, uh, and a range of other countries, because most countries did vote against the U.S. in that instance. And so she said at the uh, last night that uh, voting against the U.S. would be a criterion, but it wouldn't be the only criterion mm -hmm. in terms of uh, mm -hmm. deciding whether or not to deliver assistance to a country. So in other words, she, 
she formally put on the record that there's a big loophole there that uh, in, in terms of uh, making that a criterion. But okay, they made the rhetorical point, and they're probably going to go on funding the same countries they've always of funded. Of course, but that was an, that's an excellent insight. Okay, Ron, you heard my open regarding the issue of bipartisanship and APEC. How did the conference respond? Donald Trump does not show this year. We spoke last year about what it was that created this extraordinary moment of controversy. But how did the conference respond to Vice President Mike Pence, who obviously is associated strongly with Donald Trump? I, he had a warm reception. It wasn't as like a, as rock star as I said was Nikki Haley's, uh, but it was a warm reception. And I, I think that you know I don't know. I I think that's partly because he's just not as natural a politician as she is. Um, he's not as exposed as she is within the pro-Israel community, although he's out there. And uh, and perhaps it had something to do with this association with Donald Trump, who remains. Um, you know, at least uh, among Democrats, are very uh, unpopular. I mean, she's she's managed to create this persona for herself that somehow is more distant from Trump than a lot of other people on uh, on cabinet level that uh, that are around him. Yes, and so she's insulated to a degree. P Pence less so, so that might have uh, affected things. Yes. By the way, there are Democrats and really Jews in general who are not happy with many of. Mike Pence's social policies, right? And exactly. Especially right. when it comes to the to the gay community, so that he does not he's not popular without baggage as Nikki Haley is. At the same right, time, right. you're telling me that APAC was at least at least warm enough to be seen as cordial to Mike Pence, despite his connection to Donald Trump. Correct. Oh yeah, 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 for sure. And you know the the surefire um, applause getter was the reference to moving the embassy to Jerusalem. Okay. Uh, and that was the work of Donald Trump, and it was yes. the work of Mike Pence. So they, they yes. and people recognize that. By the way, I want to I want to digress for one second. You wrote a superb pre-convention piece, in which you showed how Donald Trump, who has a very very low, below 30% approval rating on the last January Gallup poll, right. although he has under 30%. You point out the, how many things Donald Trump has done which are wholly consistent with APAC policy and with the policy mm -hmm. really of American Jews who are pro-Israel. Speak mm -hmm. to that for one moment and then tell me how you feel the room, you've described how the room feels about Mike Pence, but whether there was any undercurrent of anti-Trump sentiment, we'll get to Netanyahu in a minute. But right now, just stick with Donald Trump, qua Trump, but, in t but contrast it with the piece you wrote that cataloged mm -hmm. all the things that Trump has done, which policy-wise are 100% in line with what American Jews, especially those who associate with APAC, were hoping an American administration would do, and finally it's Donald Trump who does them. Right, absolutely. He has, uh, he has moved the embassy. Every uh, president since, every presidential candidate since, uh, I think, um, 1984 has, promised to move the embassy except for Barack Obama. Barack Obama did He did, not I'm sorry. To at uh, APAC at APAC for half a minute. He said he would <laughs> No, he, he said no he said the embassy should be in Jerusalem, but he didn't say he was going to move it and they, and then and then his spokesman at, said he meant as part of a final status yes, solution he, the embassy. And he basically took it back that afternoon. Okay. Right. Keep right. go keep going. So yeah Trump did it. Trump uh, said that he would uh be tougher on Iran uh, and uh, and seek a better uh, Iran nuclear deal uh, without getting into what the quality of the nuclear deal is. He's certainly trying to make it more tougher, and he's trying to add additional enf enforcement. He's, he's doing that. He decertified the deal, uh, and he's making the Europeans can figure out a way where they can keep America in the deal by making uh, Iran's, the Iranian regime's life tougher. Uh, he has, like I mentioned, he's got a, I think that, 
uh, you shouldn't underestimate, I think, the success of administration's defenses of Israel. Uh, even And even the Obama administration, one thing went through at the end, but the Obama administration blocked every other Israel hostile resolution from going through at the United Nations Security Council, but he's taken it to uh, Trump and Nikki Haley have taken it to quite a quite a different level. Like I said, they've made Israel almost the front and center of their United Nations policy. Either you play along with the United with the United States on Israel, or uh, they're going to make trouble. And that's uh, they've made good on that promise. So absolutely, he's out there. But uh, and you know, I think that when he was mentioned, at least uh, in terms of his. Uh, you know, when Howard Kaur or Mort Fridman, the new president of APAC, would say, and thank you, Donald Trump, for moving the embassy to Jerusalem, there was applause. There was yeah. applause. Yeah. It wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't Nikki Haley level standing ovation or the other person who got that kind of reception was Robert Menendez. It wasn't that kind of uh, applause, but there was applause. Uh, nobody booed him. Nobody said anything. You know, the all the, and, and it's not like, APAC, it wouldn't be the right venue for this for Jews anyway, but none of the the, the hot-button issues that I think upset a lot of Jews about Donald Trump, including the, the whole business in Charlottesville last year and the immigration policy and whatever, uh, however one perceives how he treats minorities, APAC wasn't necessarily the place that that was going to come up anyway. So there was very little controversy as far as that. Okay. That so now tell us about, you just mentioned Robert Menendez. But how were the members of the Democrat leadership, Chuck Schumer, Nancy Pelosi specifically, how were they received? Well, Nancy Pelosi, I don't, I don't know. If, I mean, she was received well, uh, but it was an interesting little aside. She didn't come and like, she didn't come out to deliver the usual, um, you know, bipartisan support for Israel speech. She came out because a kind of APAC um, founding mother, Naomi Lauter, who I think must have really been an advanced years dive this year. And um, it turned out, I had no idea, that, that she, of course, Pelosi is from Baltimore originally. Um, she moved to San Francisco in 1969, and this was really her first friend and neighbor and really, you know, uh, befriended her and I guess also promoted pro-Israel uh, agendas with her. And Pelosi actually kind of, cracked up a little bit on the stage. She was really very, you know, she was crying because uh, just remembering this woman, uh, Naomi Lauter. And so that was the only, um, that was the only Pelosi presence. And yeah, you know, Chuck Schumer got, a, got an enthusiastic um, um, reception for sure. And uh, so did uh, Steny Hoyer and, um, and the other Democrats. Um, you know, one one Democrat who got a, it was interesting, that kind of elevated her to her own spot on the main stage was Grace Mang of, uh, of New York, who's a very interesting congresswoman, very pro-Israel, uh, represents a, quite a diverse and interesting district in Queens. As she said, on one end you have like a religious Jewish uh, enclave, on the other end you have an Asian enclave, and she kinds of, uh, she, she really wants to make sure she represents both. And so she got a good reception as well. Democrats mm. were well received, I think. Okay, um, I'm going to come back to the bipartisan issue, but first, what about Benjamin Netanyahu? He is currently operating under a cloud because of charges that he is guilty of corruption for taking bribes in return for implementing government policies. And again, he's not very popular among members of the Democrat Party. How was he received? He was uh, he was well received. Yeah, got a very enthusiastic response. He get a it was a, like a hyper prepared uh, speech that he gave. It was uh, it was good. It was entertaining because <laughs> he sp he started with like a PowerPoint presentation and all the uh, advances that Israel has made in technology and medicine and caring for other people and uh, and then he talked about uh, you know it was a very positive thing. Usually his his speeches at APAC are fire and brimstone and they're all about the threat of Iran and he had that in there for sure. But it was more about uh, an outlook and he talked about. The positive outlook, the cultivation of relations with Sunni Arab states in the region, and so yeah, very well received. People like people at APAC like Bibi Netanyahu. They're not so aware, I think, of the the corruption cloud that's hanging over his head in Israel that could very end his career. very interesting. But you, as a journalist, you're always your antenna is always up. Doesn't matter whether you're in a plenary, one of the breakouts that you are permitted to attend or whether you're you know, in the lobby, or whether you're at a hotel, in a restaurant, or 
many, by the, way, the, the way the hotels are set up in, in Washington, very often the bar or the restaurant is really in the lobby. So people are gathering all around. And during APAC, mm -hmm. everywhere you go, there are APAC people. Right. I want to know what you heard, what your sense was, how people were speaking either about Trump, Netanyahu, uh, peace with the Palestinians. What were the issues that were of major concern to those who were attending APAC? You know, the average attendees as well as some of the leadership of APAC. I think that the, uh, the issue of, like, that I kept on running into was the issue of bipartisan support for Israel. Mm -hmm. I think that that was a very... Uh, it wasn't just a leadership issue. You were hearing about it in the uh, the rank and file. People pe were just pe concerned. People are worried. People are worried. Yeah, because it's um, it's not something that uh, that people can take for granted a anymore. And so the um, there was just talk about how you know, and that's like I said, that was like a, a hefty portion of the breakout sessions were about that. Uh, were about that issue. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, there was just concern about how one makes, you know, there was a frustration with the progressive community, both both with the progressive community uh, in terms of not seeing the values that Israel brings to the progressive conversation. And, I, you know, I would say in last year, in past years, there might have been a frustration with APAC for not being as sensitive. But I think that this year they really they were very sensitive to progressive. Uh, you know, in past years, they've always, I've always said they've put on a show. They'll have, like, uh, you know, people of different backgrounds, uh, different colors come out, and they'll talk about uh, progressive values. But here they really sort of, they went the extra mile, I think, that when Howard Core endorsed the two-state solution, very emphatically in his speech at a time when both the Netanyahu and the Trump governments are not endorsing it, it was like he was going a little further than usual, and I think people appreciate it. I kept, I did hear that people were surprised at how deep the the uh, outreach to progressives ran at this conference. Mm -hmm. Obviously, what you're saying is that there are those within APAC who are concerned that there is an erosion of progressive, left-leaning. Democrat support, correct? Right, right, uh -huh. right. Um, incidentally, the stated goal of APEC is to represent the Israeli people and the government the Israeli people elect. Mm -hmm. When you say that Howard Cora came out so strongly for the two-state solution, I'm not sure either Netanyahu or Trump should be categorized as, as those who are against it in principle. What I right. hear Trump say sure. is, look, the parties will work it out, and if they want a two-state solution, that's what it'll be. What I hear Netanyahu saying is, we've been ready for a two-state solution. We just have no partner on the Palestinian side willing to make any gesture to move the two-state um, two solution forward. So my own feeling is that it's a misreading to think that Howard Kaur was saying something that either the Prime Minister of Israel or, for that matter, the President of the United States did not endorse. Right. No, that's for sure. I don't think that, that they're not, in, not endorsing it, but they've both... I mean, Netanyahu spoke with us as a... Um, spoke with Hebrew-speaking reporters in a briefing... And he was specifically asked about this, what happened to the two-state solution. And he was like, you know, he said, ah, I never really endorsed it. And somebody said, well, you did at bar -Lan University in 2009. We were all there. And he said, I said, you know, I, I put out an idea. I said that the Palestinians should have a degree of sovereignty, whether you want to call that state minus or whatever. It's, uh, I'm not saying it was a, uh, the two-state solution. But you're right. I don't, they're, they're not rejecting it out of hand, but by, but. Certainly, when you go, when somebody like Howard Core goes out and says that this is the solution, a two-state solution, two states living by side by side, and the other two governments won't say that, he's getting out a little bit ahead of them for sure. Okay. By the way, I find, I find what you just said to be fascinating. I don't know that it was reported. Maybe I missed it. But in some way, you're 
really making news on JBS, you're at a briefing in Hebrew with the Prime Minister right. of Israel at APAC. And when he's oh, like, at, This is actually no, at Blair House after he met with Trump, right? Okay. Yes. It wasn't part of APAC. It was simply part of his visit to Washington. But right. you're saying to me at that meeting, he's asked point blank if he supports the two-state solution, and he won't say yes. Do I understand it correctly? You're right. Yeah, he won't. What do you make of that, Ron? Um, I think that he, you know, he is, he's leading possibly the most right-wing government in Israeli history. He has to defer to his right. He doesn't want to get in trouble with his right. As soon as Howard DeCore said what he said, there was, uh, there was an uproar of, you know, in the settler movement uh, attacking AIPAC because of it. And, you know, Netanyahu doesn't want any of that. So I think that that's uh, that's what he's facing, and he you know, and he doesn't. Uh, I mean, the 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 pressure before to endorse a two state solution came from the Obama administration. It's gone now. There's a Trump administration that's agnostic about it, so he doesn't need to uh, uh, embrace it as uh, as actively as he uh, as he once did. Fascinating. It is always so wonderful to get your perspective. You can do fabulous work at the JTA, and it's always so kind of you to make time for all of our viewers here on uh, JBS. I hope from time to time you run into people who give you some nice feedback because you really no, are I do, I do. <laughs> Wonderful. A lot of JBS watches out there. Wonderful. Anyway, Kol Tuva Hatzlacha. We will speak again very soon. Thanks for the time. Thank you. Be well. Ron Campius, Washington Bureau Chief of the JTA. And, of course, you'll be able to participate in this year's APAC National Policy Conference to see many of the things that Ron has described right here on JBS as we'll be bringing you the 2018 APAC National Policy Conference. My thanks, as always, to our director, Sloan Copeland, editors John McDevitt and Cordelia Saporin, producer in general of today's show, Tisha Bader, and, of course, the producer of In the News, Carol Lilienthal. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends.